bring a children's lesson and another song. And then Brother Arvin plans to bring us the message. So we have announcements. Uh, this Sunday's offering, just in the alms fund, there's some uh, medical expenses there for Rich Spooner. And next Sunday is a deacon fund offering. Also, the Sunday school books are here. And that's, I guess, uh, a bit of faith that we'll be using those. I hope so. Uh, the adult books are right here in the back. Pick up your book. If you're a teacher, take a uh, teacher's guide as well. And I haven't talked with anyone else. The children's books are in the basement on the big table. My suggestion is, if we want to change this to another Sunday, that's fine. But my suggestion is that they just stay there until closer uh, a time when we're going to have the, the children's classes, that we just leave those there for now. Uh, other than that, the only other announcement this week is the Tuesday evening prayer meeting. We're going to start our prayer meetings again. So look forward to that and welcome each of you to that. Before we really get started, let's stand and for a prayer. Bow our heads. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning and we're truly grateful for this opportunity to be here in your house and worship. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this congregation. And this morning as we begin, we just pray that everything that we would do and say here this morning would bring honor and glory to your name. I just ask that you would uh, be in all parts of the service, the songs, the children's lesson, may it be meaningful, and the message, I just pray a blessing on Brother Arvin as he brings us that message, that it would be words from you, and we just pray that you would give him those words for us this morning. Father, I just thank you for each one that's in health and able to come out here this morning. We pray for those that uh, are not able to be here with us. Pray that you would continue to meet their needs. I just think of Brother Harold, just continue to bless him and his wife at home, maybe others as well. Father, I just pray that Again, that your spirit would be here among us and would bless each one. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Welcome you each to Mount Olive. Let's begin our singing with song number 127, your hymns of the church. Number 127. I sing the mighty...
261. Two hundred sixty one. Oh, rise, glorious God. Number 158. Let's omit verse 2 in this one. Three hundred fifty two. Three 
352. Oh, rise up, O men of God. Good morning. We greet you in the Master's name this morning. I'm going to have to maybe ask the teachers to close their ears and eyes maybe for a little bit because I'm pretty much in over my head. But I'm going to try to give a children's lesson here. So have you ever heard of someone who misquotes a verse? It happens all the time. A lot of times when people misquote verses, they're a lot of times trying to justify their sin um, or maybe they're just being plain rude and want to justify their actions. It could go like this. Uh, one sibling could push another into the ground, and then they would say, well, all things work together for those that love God. And we would call that a gross misuse of a verse. There's a verse in the New Testament. I'm going to misquote it slightly, but I think it applies here, and it's not as bad as the one I just mentioned. In 1 Corinthians 11, 14, it says, Doth not nature itself teach you, and then it goes on to say, that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. I'm not going to talk about long hair this morning, but I want to use the first part of that verse. Doth not nature itself teach you? And I would like to make a link this morning between some numbers and the fact that nature can teach us things and that there is a master creator behind it all. So, from ninth grade and down, I'm debating on what age to do that, can anyone tell me what the significance of these numbers are? It's 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, and 89. From ninth grade down, anybody know what the significance of those numbers are? Okay. Anybody that's in school, period. No takers? Okay. So um, I saw one hand back there, but I guess he's no longer in school. Can anybody tell me what the significance of those numbers are? They're the Fibonacci sequence. I guess I could have gave you a clue. Here's Mr. Fibonacci himself. Um, not that that would have been much of a clue. 
Actually, his name is not Fibonacci. His name is Leonardo of Pisa. He was born in around 1170. When I was a young man, oh, I'm going to guess a year or two older than Tori. I was maybe about 14. Didn't have my driver's license, but I was old enough to be left out of the house for a few hours now and then. Um, I picked raspberries for a man over here by the name of Earl Miller. And if the story goes right, which he is already deceased, in the phone book they had his name down as Earl Asparagus Miller. And that was because I guess there was multiple Earl Millers and Earl Asparagus Miller kind of set him aside as that Earl Miller. And so even when I think of him today, I think of him as it could be Earl Miller or you might tag on the end of that, Earl Spires Miller. Well, that's what happened to Leonardo. After he was dead, he became Leonardo Fibonacci. And that's even some 700 years later. We're still calling him that. But that was not his birth given name. He's not the first one that's, that figured out this sequence of numbers. It was given, actually, there's evidence that it was back in the Indian culture hundreds of years before that, that they figured this out. And you say, well, what is this number? And it's like, what's the big deal? Well, if you follow the pattern and you start with the first two, you go zero and one and you add those together and you come up with one. One and two equal three, three and five equal eight, and on and on and on. And that runs out through infinity. They add up. You say, well, who cares? Numbers added to each other. What does that mean? Well, it's all very benign until you dig a little deeper. If you dig a little deeper and you start looking around in nature, you'll soon find these numbers show up time and time again. Um, most petals of the flowers, flowers, if you count the petals on the flowers, they will come up to one of these Fibonacci numbers. This one here has eight petals on it. The next one that I'll show you here, um, they'll have three, five, and eight again. Um, sorry, they're pretty small there. I wasn't getting them printed out a whole lot bigger than that. So then, I'm sure you've heard of um, clo four-leaf clovers, right? They're hard, a little bit hard to come by. Um, they are, they do happen, but they're obviously not as, not as um, common as a three-leaf clover. Um, so there's, there's always exceptions to the rule. Um, there's exceptions to every rule. There's, but it's, you start to see these things cluster together, and it's interesting. If you cut an apple in half, how many seeds does it have? It has five. It's a Fibonacci number. If you cut a banana in half, how many do you have? I know what I like to do with bananas. When you're eating banana, I like to take and shove my tongue down through it, and they'll fold open into three little sections. Um, so if you all need something to try tonight, you can eat a banana and push your tongue down into the end of it, and it will fold into three sections. Another Fibonacci number. Gets a little more complex here. This is a sunflower. Um, a lot of times if you count even the petals around the flower, a lot of times they'll add up to one of these numbers. This sunflower here, um, a lot of sunflowers will have the seeds laid out in spirals. The amount of spirals a lot of times will come up with a Fibonacci number. And that all sounds interesting, but then, sorry, it takes another little twist. So, this is where the drawing gets a little, a little, um, yeah, I'm not an artist. But if you, I'm going to attempt to do this, but if you would take the numbers one and one and make two squares that would be like one inch by one inch and place them side by side, then the next set of numbers you would take a two by two and attempt to lay them side by side. Next number's three. If you attempt to take a three by three and lay that side by side, and then you wind up with a five by five over top of that, and then an eight by eight on top of that, and I'm gonna stop there because you could go 13 by 13, but it just keeps on going. If you will take and make a slight curve across the first one, across the second one, across the third one, across the fourth one, the five by five, and you get this here, this spiral. <clears throat> that is called the Fibonacci curve. 
And you say, well, what does that prove? It doesn't really prove anything other than you find it all over in nature again. The spiral of the, the sunflower seeds matches those curves. If you um, take a knot, a, a, a shell, cut it in half, Again, those curves are, are being met on those things. If you step out a little bit further and you go to a, a, the, a tropical storm on, a, on a, um, a radar of some sort, again, you find this Fibonacci curve that spiral that is. It's all through nature. It's in, it's in hurricanes. It's in tails of seahorses. It's in snails. They all follow this, this curve. Step way, way out, and you will find in the galaxies the, the Fibonacci spiral in the galaxies. It's in all the plants and that type of thing also. And the one I like the most is it's in the plants, again, the, the sunflower seeds. And the one I like the most, it's in the DNA strands that are in the very core of you and I. There's Fibonacci numbers and spirals in those strands that's clear down inside of you. There's one more thing, a couple more things you could do with Fibonacci numbers. Um, so one is, so if you start dividing the numbers in front of each other, from one to the other, if you divide three by two, you wind up with 1.5. 1. 1. If you go Five by three, you wind up with 1.666. And as you get further and further up, the more, the more large the numbers come up to, you eventually get to a number that they have is 1.618. And they call that the golden number. And the golden number is an interesting one because the golden number, they can find that all over the place too. If you would take the height of a man, and divide it by the 1.68, the, um, the sum of that would be right about your navel. Um, people, I did this with my children a little bit. Um, some of them worked out, some of them didn't. Um, but they would say when you start looking into what the world would consider a beautifully shaped head, they would say it is about 1.66 to 1. The width versus the height is about 1.66618. We know that that's not exactly how God views beauty. God makes each and every one of us beautiful. Some people have really fat round heads and some are longer. Um, but there is, a, there is many other places where that's used also. Like if you figure out the, the width of your hand versus the length of your arm, those all come out to, again, about that same ratio. So the ratio just shows up over and over again, everything from your head to your... Um, to your yeah, your overall height of your body. Ironically, if you look at the, um, some of the ratios and the measurements between the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark that floated on water, those come out to about 1.66 and right in that ratio. So um, generally, these sizes tend to be considered aesthetically beautiful. Um, the, the great artists of, our, of, the hist of the past have used these ratios. Um, you can't hardly figure it. Well, let me get to that in a bit. But um, I, I'm not, the, the people's not sure exactly why these things always show up. I would tend to believe it has something to do with the, a master creator that, that he, he likes things like this. He likes Fibonacci's. He likes relative numbers like this. He, he, he designed this. It wasn't by accident. There's almost no no way to believe that, that this all just exploded and, and came together into this level of order that God, has, that God has created us by. Now, many days, people will use these numbers in relating to, like, designing stuff. So this is the CNN tower, um, the ratio of where that little ball structure is in relation to the overall. They've, they've used a, a Fibonacci number. The... Sorry, I got my papers all mixed up here. In Psalms 19, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Romans 1.20 says, For the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been seen clearly, 
being understood, though, what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So there's things in nature, and there's people that don't want to admit to it. There's people that are talking about it. If you look up Fibonacci numbers and the ratios and stuff on the, the internet, there's people that, um, that get really deep into the nature and want to talk about the relations thereof. Then, of course, there's people that don't want to admit that there's a designer and a creator of all this, and so they would probably rather ignore that. The two get that interest me, that cause me even further question, is the fact that if you, this is Mr. Fibonacci when he wrote his book, the book of calculations, I think it is, or something like that, he made this Fibonacci sequence well known. Um, the thing that interests me, and that was in 1170, the thing that interests me is that you go way back long before that, in the time of Romans, in the time of the Egyptians, and they were building buildings using these ratios um, with the size of their, their buildings and all that. And if you take the, the pyramids and um, those, those dimensions work out the Fibonacci numbers also, and it just makes me wonder, makes me wonder, did they know something about Fibonacci numbers and called them something else? Did they know the golden number, the golden ratios? Or does God have instilled in us uh, a sense of mathematics of what is aesthetically beautiful and they were men that were just designing and, and creating what they knew was in their heart? And um, I don't know, but I do know that we have an awesome creator and that he loves order. And I believe that our God is also a God of numbers. So I'll leave you with that. Greetings in Jesus' name this morning.
We welcome you to this service, however you are worshiping with us. I've titled the message this morning, Three Eternal Blessings, and you will find this in Psalm 116. We're going to spend our entire morning here in Psalm 116. And the purpose of the message this morning is to sharpen your appreciation for what God has done to us in delivering us from, the, uh, from a path that would lead to eternal death. <clears throat> Sometimes we get so used to the idea that, that we are saved and that God has taken care of us that we just kind of almost um, lose our wonder at it all. And I would like to um, help us sharpen that again a bit this morning and think about what God has done for us. And Psalm 116 is um, that psalm. I was going to spend the whole morning in verse 8. And as sometimes happens to ministers, you get to study in and after, and 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 your, your message just kind of goes someplace different than what you had anticipated uh, a week before. And this is one of those times because um, when I got to looking at the whole psalm, you, you get to thinking, well, why would I, why would I pick out one verse out of, a, out of a psalm that is so rich? And so um, I'd just like to examine this psalm this morning verse by verse and see what we can learn. Now, it's not known... We don't know the author. Uh, it was probably not David, but it was somebody who was in big trouble. And we don't even know what the trouble was. Um, he had some severe difficulties. And uh, we, we, just don't, we just don't know. We don't know what caused him to write the psalm, but we do know how he reflected on this experience later on and, and what this experience meant to him. And so we don't know, was he sick almost to death? Uh, is, is that what his problem was? Was he uh, in trouble with his enemy and he was pretty sure that he was going to be killed? We don't know that. Or was it an emotionally charged battle against wrong and he didn't know which way to turn hardly, whether, you know... How do, you, how do you solve this problem? A question that didn't have an apparent right answer? Or, or any other, other possible uh, list of scenarios that this, that this could have been? And, and we don't know. But we do have recorded for us, we don't have recorded what happened that caused the psalm, but we do have recorded in the psalm his feelings after this whole thing was over. And this psalm is called A Prayer for Deliverance. That's what I would call it. Um, he called on the Lord. The, the gist of the song is, psalm is that he called on the Lord and deliverance was forthcoming. And deliverance came. And then he was extremely grateful that God had heard his prayer, that God answered his prayer. And he was in the midst of a storm, so to speak, hypothetically. He was in the midst of a storm and he didn't know which way to turn. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know how it was going to turn out. Uh, and then the storm got over. And now he is on this side of the storm. And he is looking at the storm. And he's looking back at it. And he is determining that uh, what had happened was something that was worthy of note and something that changed him. I believe that this experience, whatever it was, uh, made him a changed man. I, I, really, I really believe that. We, we can gather that from what, from what he says during the psalm. And in this psalm, he makes three major declarations, and as we go along, I'll, I'll stop at each one of those declarations and, and talk about it a little bit, about things he says very positively about his experience. Um, so if you have your Bible, I encourage you to follow along. Psalm 116, verse 1. He starts out with, I love the Lord. And I think all of us, most of us would say that this morning. I love the Lord. Just as a blanket statement. I love the Lord. 
Well, I would ask you, why do you love the Lord? Why do you love the Lord? I think most of us would say that in the beginning of our relationship with God, with Jesus, that we loved him for one reason, and that is for deliverance. Um, I don't think, at least if your experience was anything like mine, you didn't, you didn't love the Lord for, for loving the Lord for himself. You loved the Lord because, because you were in trouble. You were afraid of what was going to happen when you died, if you died, and you weren't sure where you, know, where you would end up, or maybe you were sure where you would end up, and you didn't like that thought. And, and so God offered you a way out, and you took it. Kind of what he says here. Um, he said, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. We like people that listen to us. He said, I, he heard my voice and my supplication. This man had a problem that he could not fix himself. He was in over his head, and he said, I love the Lord. I cried out to him, and what do you know? He heard me. We, we like it when people hear us out, uh, and especially if someone hears us out that can do something for us. We should be extremely grateful that God hears our prayers, that God hears us out. Um, sometimes it says that we have groanings too great for words, too great for tears. We, we have these things that, that, that are just overwhelming us, and we have assurance that God hears us out. Verse 2 says, be, why? He said, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Now he's saying that I know that God has inclined his ear unto me. Something happened in my life, something happened in my situation, and I have no other explanation for the change. And this has happened many times to all of us, I think, that this something has happened that we say, like, well, that was God. It had to be. I mean, there's, there's no other explanation for it. Pure chance doesn't, doesn't allow for this type of thing. So his first de declaration is in verse 2. He says, Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. This is his first response. He has, I have learned by experience, he says, I've learned by experience that the Lord hears me. Consequently, I will call upon him as long as I live. In Old Testament history, people called on every type of God that there was. They didn't answer. Here he says, he heard me. And he says, I will call upon him as long as I live. This is the first positive response. The psalmist says, I know he heard me. God has taken his cause and has done something about it. He eliminated his crisis. And so the psalmist says, starting today, there's going to be a new norm. Starting today, I will call upon God as long as I live. That's why I say, I think, that he was a changed man. We learn things in times of difficulty. And we learn how to cope because God is with us. And so, this is his first declaration. I will call upon him as long as I live. That's a, that's a life. He don't know how long he's going to live. I don't know how I'm going to, long I'm going to live. You don't know how long you're going to live. Are you going to call upon God as long as you live? It seems like people sometimes accept Christ as their personal Savior they get excited about it for a while, and then after a while, it just kind of goes by the wayside. And after a while, you find out that they're not calling on God as long as they live. That somehow or another, somewhere along the line, they have, they have lost that love for God. I love the Lord. 
they, they have lost that. And they just kind of go by the wayside and, and uh, just kind of go away. You never hear anything out of them again. Verse 3, he says, The sorrows of death compass me about, and the pains of hell get hold on me. I found trouble and sorrow. Uh, we don't know. Again, we don't know what his problem was. But he says, he says that the sorrows of death compass me about. He evidently felt like that he could die at any minute. That this could, this could be uh, catastrophic. This, this, uh, this could be terminal. He says the, the sorrows of death compass me about. It was something that he was thinking about a lot. He said, and the pains of hell got hold on me, and I found trouble and sorrow. Again, we don't know the extent. We know they were extreme, and, they know, and we know that they were without relief. And the text would give some indication that maybe he was in physical or mental pain. Psalm 116 in the New 3 verse in the, in the New King James says, The pains of death surrounded me, and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. The, uh, the connotation there, the sorrows of death, um, you look into the, to the Greek, Hebrew, I'm sorry, uh, it has this indication of either a rope or a noose wrapped around him. So like, see, like, he says that the sorrows of death compass me about. In other words, he was being wrapped up by this, by this uh, all-encompassing uh, pain, this all-encompassing problem, and it's, it's just wrapping him up, and he can't even, he can't even, he can't even breathe. Um, he was definitely without relief. He could not, he, he didn't feel like he could hang on any longer. He said, like, he said, they got hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. And then in verse 4, he says, Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver me. So he offers this frantic pre prayer for deliverance. Um, he, he is in dire straits. Like he is out of options. Nothing that he knows about or can understand can help him. He is, he is out of options. And sometimes maybe the sooner that we get find out that we are out of options, instead of fighting it and fighting it is the, is the time when the Lord will work for us quicker than if we just put ourselves through all this pain and try to figure out every other way to do something. And finally we get to the end of ourselves and we say, okay, I beseech you, deliver my soul. So he offers this frantic plea for deliverance. And guess what? God comes to his rescue. Before, between verse 4 and 5 is when he is rescued. He offers this plea. I beseech you, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. And God answers it. And, and then his whole demeanor changes in verse 5 and 6. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, God is, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Um, he realizes now, he said, gracious is the Lord. I, he, he helped me out of this. And righteous and merciful that he, um, that God delivered him. You think God is so merciful. And sometimes we have to remember that that even in our deepest uh, problems that we have, you know, that sometimes trite phrase that we use, God is good all the time, and, and we know it and we believe it, but sometimes it's a little hard when we are in the difficult times of life. But he says, I was brought low and he helped me. He said he preserveth the simple. I think that's an interesting phrase. When we... Uh, in, in, uh, in the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, when it talks about a simple person, it talks about a person who is um, seducible, easily, easily swayed. And, and he realized, he said that, he, he calls it himself, he says like, the Lord preserveth the simple. And I take that to mean that God has shown mercy and protected him even in his simplicity 
He preserved the seducible from being seduced, uh, whether it was seduced to sin, whether it was seduced to unbelief, whatever it was seduced to. He understands that in this whole thing, he was not full of wisdom and that he could have easily fallen and he could have easily come to some wrong conclusion about this whole thing. But he said, God preserved me in my, shall I say, my simpleness, in my stupidity, in my, in my inability to, to think right because of this thing that's on me. Anyhow, he understands that God has preserved him. He has shown mercy. He has protected him. And then in verse 7, he says, Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Be at peace. The storm's over. He said, be at rest. That turmoil that he felt, whatever it was in the first six verses or five, four verses, that turmoil, that, that insecurity, that um, uncertainness is, is now gone. God has answered his prayer in a way that he couldn't even fathom. And in doing that, he just says, be at rest of my soul. For the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. What a, what a testimony. And so then the next verse, he says, well, you, you say, it says here, return unto thy rest, O my soul. So we, could, we would say, it is well with my soul. So why was it well with his soul? What, what reasons did he have? What, uh, what, was the, what was the overarching principle of why he now had peace? Well, verse 8, which is... The, I guess you would say is my favorite verse here and the one I was going to spend a lot of time on, but it's just now part of the, if it's just part of the, the sermon. And verse 8 says, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. That's why his soul is at rest, because the Lord has delivered his soul from death, his eyes from tears, and his feet from falling. And, and since we don't know what his problem was, it's a little hard to determine how to determine what he was looking at when he penned these words. And all we can do is, is to kind of take them for ourselves because the same thing has happened to us. Uh, if you're a Christian here this morning, then your soul has been delivered from death, your eyes have been delivered from tears, and your feet have been delivered from falling. So how does, this, how does this work? So the first phrase, the psalmist says that his soul was delivered from death. In a theological sense, um, we believe that the soul never ceased to exist. So how could a soul die if it never ceases to exist? That's, that's a theological question. Um, and we believe that the soul never dies. We believe that the soul is eternal. But Jesus does speak of eternal death and the second death. And so even though the soul never loses its abilities to, to be coherent, um, things happen to it which is death. Um, Explain to me how the, the absence of God in the life of a soul is not death. It is death. Um, Jesus says in Matthew 25, 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So the promise is that the righteous shall inherit eternal life. And if we inherit eternal life, that is nothing short of being delivered having our soul delivered from death. It's the same thing. To receive eternal life is the same as having our soul delivered from eternal death. Um, there's only two destinies. And the one is eternal life, and then in stark contrast, 
eternal death. Revelation uh, 20, verses 12 to 15, uh, puts this in very um, uh, plain words, and I'll read that. Revelation 20, verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which was in them, and death and hell delivered up the dead which is in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so in a very true sense, the psalmist could say, you have delivered my soul from death. If in trusting in God, he become, um, he become a child of God, and God has special things for his children that learn to trust him, then he, without a shadow of a de- doubt, was delivered from death. The second is that his eyes were delivered from tears. How is it true of us? How is our eyes delivered from, from, from tears? Um, We still cry occasionally. Most of us do. Um, So how are we delivered from tears? Well, the first of all is also an eternal thing. We are delivered from the pain and sorrow of torment. Matthew 8, 12 says, But the children of this kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is a source of tears that we never have to experience. That just never has to be a part of our experience. Um, So we are delivered from that. The second area I see in the way that we are delivered from tears is, is the difference that we have when a loved one passes away who is a child of God. Upon the death of a loved one, we sorrow not as those who have no hope, as a Christian, our sorrow takes on a different tenor. It, it's, it's not the same. Um, it's, we have an aspect of our sorrow that is not available or known to a non-believer. We don't sorrow as those who have no hope. If our loved one goes on to be with the Lord, we, we sorrow, we cry, we are sorry for ourselves, we're sorry but we're certainly not sorry that our loved one got to go to heaven. We're not sorry about that. We're not crying about that. We actually are crying for the loss and for ourselves and for our, uh, our losses. But we don't despair like those who have no hope. Our, our sorrow is mingled with the glorious prospect of a future with Jesus. And then the third way we are delivered from tears is for all believers, tears will be over someday, never to whelm up in our eyes again. Revelation 21, 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, neither shall be there any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So that's three ways, I think, that not only the psalmist, but also we have been, our tears, our eyes have been delivered from tears. The third one is that he has kept our feet from falling. Um, as Christian, we have a firm foundation to stand on. We don't have to worry too much about falling if we are standing on the solid rock. It's just not, it, it, it's always a possibility, of course, that we can slip and fall. And um, Psalm 40, verse 2, He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the merry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Jude one twenty four. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his joy with exceeding joy. Psalm 18.36 Thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. What, what way can we give ourselves a firm foundation, a firm platform? I see the difference in my mind 
um, is steps of where you have teeny little steps that are slippery, maybe on rocks, or, uh, or steps that are wide and deep that when you can walk up them, you know that you, you, just, you just don't really fear too much of falling because uh, someone has been there and has made it easy for us. And I think, um, well, how do, we, how, do we, how do we end up on a wide set of stairs or on a wide platform? I'm not really, I'm not really too concerned about falling off of this platform. It's huge unless I get right over to the edge. And so what do we do? How can we, how can we, uh, what can we do to ensure that we have our, that our steps do not fall? Well, I believe just a few things. Studying the scriptures, finding out what the, what the, what the Bible says. Um, I, I've said this before. You know, I just, I just read, you know, I read through the Bible every year, and every time I get to this thing with David and Bathsheba, I just, oh, please, don't do it, David. This, this is horrible. This is going to turn out awful for you. And it does. Every time it turns out the same way. From the time, the time that David sinned with Bathsheba, his, his life and his family went totally downhill. You, you have Tamar, you have Absalom, you have... I mean, it's, just, it's just a total mess. And, it, and it's because that David believed that as king he could get by with this sin with Bathsheba and there's, there's always a reaping. And so we keep ourselves away from the reaping. It, it gives us a more solid uh, footing. So studying the scriptures, praying, hearing the word, fellowshipping with other saints, I believe enlarges our platform. So I think these three blessings that God has granted us are among the most valuable blessings that God has made available to us. And then in verse 9, he comes up with a second declaration. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. So first he says, I will honor the Lord. Um, I will call upon the name of the Lord. Now he's adding to it. He's adding another level. He's, in this verse, he adds a second layer of dedication. He will walk before the Lord. Not like Jonah, who uh, tried to run away from the Lord. But he said, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. As long as I live, as long as I am in the land of the living, I'm going to walk before the Lord. That is, it is a second declaration. Consistent and deliberate walking before the Lord. And most of us know that it takes a lot more work to walk than it does to talk. It takes a lot more dedication, more wisdom, and spirit power to live an honest, upright Christian life than it does to talk about an honest, upright Christian life. Verse 10, I believe, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. He was convinced that God alone was the deliverer. And anybody that gave him a false hope by saying, maybe you ought to try this, or maybe you ought to do this, Anything outside of something that was uh, God-honoring or God-ordained, uh, he, says, he, he says it's not truth. And the New Testament does say that let God be true and every man a liar. So he was, uh, he was a little ahead of that in the Psalms by uh, maybe five or seven hundred years. But... He said, there's no, he said, I am convinced that there's no earthly solution that will work. No, no thing that you can offer me that will work like calling on God will work. And I'm here to tell you this morning that that is, that is true. It, it's, it's just amazing. Um, it's, it's amazing how God s solves your difficulties in life in ways that you didn't even have have any idea. You just, you're like, I, I don't have no idea how I'm going to get out of this. And here God makes a way through and it, wow, never even thought of that. And I hope you, I hope that's happened to you. I, I really do. That God has been, has worked in your life in ways that you didn't even realize how he was moving things around so that, uh, that he could bless you. Then in verse 12, he said, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits unto me? We want to know what things cost. You know, uh, he said, now what, what can I pay? You, you, you've, done, you've done all these wonderful things for me. 
Now, what, what's the tab? You know, I like, I like clean transactions. I don't like payments. I don't like uh, open-ended transactions. You know, this, uh, this week I went to the uh, eye doctor and got an uh, exam, and then I got some, uh, ordered some lenses for my the glasses that I have currently. And so, uh, you know, you do all this, and then they say, it's so much. Now, you can pay half if you want. Now, no, let me pay it all. I want it to be, I want it to be over with. I want to, when I walk out of here, I want our transaction. I've got what I need. You got what you need. I have an exam. I have glasses coming. Uh, you have electronic transfer of money. We're done. If I decide never to come back, I don't have to, you know. Not that I wouldn't. I'm just saying it's, just like it's over. And so that's, our, that's kind of our, the way we are. It's like, what can we do to pay this off so that, so that, so that it's over, we can forget about it. Um, the psalmist said, what can I do to pay the score? What can I pay to even the score? Is there something I can offer God for his benefits that would be valuable to him, that I could pay him, that uh, we could be even on that? I like, I like the words of the prophet Micah. He has a beautiful way to accent the futility of payment of anything less than a life of service. Micah 6, 6 to 8. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? What, what shall I bring? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Would that be enough? Would, uh, no? Well, would he be pleased with thousands of rams? Or 10,000 rivers of oil? Would that, like, would that satisfy him? Um, now we're really going to get personal. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Would that do it? The reply is, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. God owns the whole word, world. He said, the, he said, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. He said, if I was hungry, I wouldn't even tell you. I could take one of those cattle off of a thousand hills if I was into the beef. He said, I, there's, there's nothing you can do. Not, there's nothing that you can give me physically to satisfy this debt. And so then he says something strange. It seems like. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. He said, well, what can I give? Oh, well, I'll take some more. Well, what, what is it like taking more? Um, God has offered a, a cup of salvation. There's nothing more valuable in the world than the cup of salvation. There is nothing more valuable. There is nothing that he can give you that's any more valuable. You, you want salvation. You want relief from this direction that you're headed to eternal hell. He said, I'm offering you the cup of salvation. Now just think. I, I hope this has never, ever, will ever, ever happen to any of you. But suppose that you knew that your spouse liked coffee. And they liked it fixed just a certain way. And not only that, you knew how to fix it exactly like they liked it. And so you wanted to do something nice for them. And so you fixed a cup of coffee that was exactly the way they wanted it. Plus you put a little love in it and a little, uh, you know, care and, and concern. You, you, you fixed this cup for them and you took it to him, and he slapped it out of your hand. Can you imagine how awful you would feel? I mean, you, just, you would just feel absolutely terrible. Like, what did I do to deserve that? Well, think about now. God is offering us the most valuable, important cup in the world. 
and there are untold thousands of people that say, I'm sorry, I don't want it. In some ways, even slap it out of his hand. How do you think God feels when countless people refuse the cup of salvation? And I'm begging you, don't be one of those. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He offers this cup of salvation, that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not, he that refuseth the cup, believeth not, is condemned already, because he believeth not in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So that's why we take the cup of salvation. There is, there is strings attached, I guess you would say. But it is the only way for us to get relief from this awful situation that we're in that has no relief except the cup of salvation. And then verse 14, his third declaration, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Now he's adding another layer of commitment. First he's going to talk about it, now he's going to walk it, and now he's going to dig into his finances. And I think when, the God, when God has all three of them, then he's got you. Sometimes we, we talk nice and sometimes we walk nice, and, 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 but we don't, we don't give the finances. Uh, you know, um, vows, offering, tithes, and sacrifices cost a lot of money. Cattle, um, first of the crops, uh, go, um, going to the temple or going to the tabernacle three times a year. Uh, it was... It was, a, it, was a, it was a task. It was a chore. Especially a chore if you weren't, if you weren't uh, dedicated to the cause. When, when Hannah brought that child to Eli and she brought a, a heifer, a bottle of wine, and maybe what, what the third thing was, thing what, like, this didn't, this didn't, she wasn't fretting over that. She was so happy that she could give these things to the Lord that, that it didn't mean anything to her. Um, so I say, he was walking, he was talking, and now he was going to tithe. I would say that now he's pretty much all in. He, 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 is, he, he is convinced for sure now. Third declaration. And then 15 has kind of looks like in some ways that we, we quote this verse by itself a lot of times out of the context of the, of the scripture and in, in, some, in a way some ways it looks like maybe it's a little out of place because it it's just kind of changes subjects it sounds like precious is the sight in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints this is the psalmist saying that so what is the what is the uh, text here How precious to God is a man or woman who dies, having accepted the cup of salvation, talks about him daily, walks with him continually, and given up his possessions to God. You think that wouldn't be precious in the sight of God? God has made a special place for somebody who does that. It's called heaven. Then to verse 16. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant, and the son of thy handmaid thou hast loosened my bonds. He, he goes back over this again. He's like, I, I am going to serve you forever. I love you. I'm going to serve you forever because you have loosened my bonds. You have, you have saved my soul from death. You have taken away my problem, whatever it was. I don't know. Uh, but you have, you have worked a miracle in my life. I'm a changed person, and I am thy servant and the son of thy handmaid, you have loosened my bonds, and I am yours forever. He got relief 
in a way that no human person could relieve him. And we confess that we are servants of God, and our circumstances are kind of, in a lot of ways, no different. Uh, we have been delivered from sure death just the way he has. Um, it says here, he had loosened my bonds. Remember, he was talking about that he said the, the, the bonds of death were around him. And now he's saying that you have loosened my bonds, that, those, that, that fear, that, that pain of death, those, that noose, that ropes wrapped around him, is like, is gone. Uh, and I am your servant. In verse 17, he just reiterates what he had said earlier. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. I will pay my vows now. Uh, I'm not going to put it off. I'm not going to uh, wait a long, long time. He said, I will pay my vows now. I am, I am convinced I am all in. I will pay my vows now in the presence of his people. And I like that. He said in the presence of his people. Um, he didn't go out and do this in a corner somewhere. He said, I, will, I, am, I am so thankful, so grateful, so excited at what you have done for me. I will pay my vows now in the presence of my people. I don't care who sees it. I'm going to pay my vows now. And then verse 19, in closing. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. What are he saying here? I would say, we would say, um, did he want to make a public confession? Or a public declaration? Or a public, and he has. We're reading it today, many, 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 many years later, how he said that I will walk and I will talk and I will give. Um, he said, I will... In the courts of the Lord's house, we would say, like, in the the, midst of the church, in the midst of the congregation, uh, no secret follower here is a man who is a changed man and says, I I want to do this. I want to be upright. I want to talk. I want to offer in the midst of God's people. That's what I want to do. So, a deep appreciation and a thankful heart Backed up by a life of service is the answer to the marvelous deliverance we have experienced at the hand of Jesus. And I am, would like to say that I don't think that anything less than that will do. A deep appreciation, a thankful heart, backed up by a life of service. We will walk, we will talk, we will give to the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Men, women, and children preaching deliverance from sin and death by the hand of Jesus because we have experienced it. Let's kneel for prayer. Thank you, our Father, for uh, this Psalm 116. We thank you that you have given it to us and we can uh, learn many things from it. We thank you of the dedication that we see here from this this psalmist who was willing to... um, declare publicly what you have done for him. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the deliverance that you have shown to us. We thank you for all the graciousness you have given to us and the, and the, and the many blessings. And we thank you that you have uh, delivered our soul from hell and our eyes from tears and our feet from falling. We, we thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, that we would be exceedingly grateful and thankful and live a life of thanksgiving for all you have done for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Sing number 346. The hymns of the church, number 346.
Thank you for your prayers and attention. Let's let's stand for dismissal. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. You're dismissed. Go in peace.